Islam Salama. Uh, Tino Lago Bandele Elamin, Chief Noble Bandele Elamin. Uh, this video is basically, we're going to deal with the Treaty of Peace and Friendship with Morocco. You can also find uh, the book that I've compiled dealing with the treaty, dealing with Treaty of Camp Holmes, and the treaty's Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People. All this can be found in the book called Morris Treaties. You can find that book on Indigenous Peoples Inc. Webs.com. And you can also find books on Amazon.com. So look out for the Moors Moabite Man, which you can find that at Amazon.com. Uh, but for the purpose of this lecture or this video, we will deal with the treaty. This is the first of part two with dealing with treaties. So this is part one. We'll be dealing with the Treaty of Peace in this one, and then we'll be dealing with the Treaty of Camp Homes in the second one. So um, just to be on the lookout for that. But to start with the treaty, when we look at the Treaty of Peace and Friendship with Morocco, it's important to Moorish Americans because it directly relates to Moors. And it is an important treaty with the United States as well, which we will discover as we go through this video. So before we go into the treaty, we have to first look at the years preceding the treaty. So when we look back at roughly 10 years before the treaty was really signed, uh, we're looking at 1770s. So like in 1777, uh, you'll find that there was an outbreak of the uh, American Revolution. And because of that, um, American ship merchants who had sailed under the Britain banner or flag and under the Britain tributes, which uh, these tributes were given to North African coastal states called the Barbary Tribute. These tributes that Britain made were no longer protecting American ships because the um, revolt, if you will, against the American co the British colonies in uh, America oh. against Britain. 1776, we learned that the Declaration of Independence was the breaking or the severance of ties between the British colonies, now the American colonies, against Britain uh, colonial power. Because of that, uh, so with that being in mind, there was a need for Americans to quickly come with a uh, peaceful treaty with the Moroccan or Barbary states. Uh, so in 17, by 1784, Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, they all authorized Congress to conclude treaties of friendship with Morocco, Algiers, Tunis, and Tripoli. Thomas Barclay, uh, which was the council general in Paris, he was assigned to be the negotiator for the Treaty of Marrakesh. Uh, so understand that with this treaty, this treaty was a commercial treaty, it says. When you read the book, um, Morris Treaties, it talks about it being a commercial treaty. Uh, being that it, it was allowing the American colonies to do business, without any conflict between the two nations. But this treaty also was a treaty between two sovereign nations. We have begun to understand that America being, uh, I guess maybe not even a year, a year maybe, that America had declared their independence within a year, they're uh, looking at uh, trying to seek remedy from the, the, Mor Mor the uh, Moroccans to have some type of sovereignty or protection. But with that treaty, the treaty could not have been ratified unless both nations were considered sovereign. So it's important that the treaty allows or basically legitimate, makes, makes the United States legitimately a sovereign power. 
Um, so with that, if we look at what was going on in that time frame, what was the United States need for a treaty with Morocco? Because many people, we don't talk, we're not taught this in school or we're not taught this in actual history. So when we look at the 18th century, we understand that Moors, they controlled the Atlantic Ocean and they controlled the Mediterranean Sea in many parts. Uh, and, and, since, and since the 1490s, 1492, the defeat of the Moors in Spain, uh, the Moors had retreated from Europe into Africa. And from Africa, they, the Moors began their assault on the European nations by way of the water. Because they still controlled the water or the seas uh, at that time. They, they began to uh, go up and go up and down the coastlines of Europe, raiding and uh, taking people as slaves. So at this time, you have what they call uh, Christian slaves, which are essentially European slaves or what is misnomer as white slaves. These are people that are being taken by the Moors from roughly the 1600s until the 1800s. So, uh, because of that, so you have to remember, and at that time that this was going on, America in the, eight, in the 1700s, 1770s, was basically a, uh, a small nation in, in regards to strength or military power or even economic power. America had very little power in the 1700s and was fighting for their survival as a nation. So at that time, uh, in the 1770s, and then you go into the 1780s, when America actually finished fighting the war, they are still, basically they're broke. They're a, um, uh, a nation that is beginning to try to put together an economy and things of that nature, so they are not regarded on the wealth on the world scale as a significant nation. Uh, many of us, you know, look at America today and see it as a superpower, but realizing that uh, America really didn't become a superpower until the 1900s, uh, and so because of that, America needing to have a relationship with this power, which still had more, the Moroccan or Barbary powers, still had a significant amount of clout and power and influence among the international community. So it was in the best interest for the United States to uh, have a treaty with them so that they would not have to worry about slavery or their commercial ventures being spoiled by pirates on the coast or in the, in, in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, but with this treaty, the Moors, when the treaty was created, the Moors, with that treaty, it's automatically, their Moors are assuming that America is a sovereign nation, which is very important because when you are trying to become independent, regardless if you're becoming an independent nation or independent uh, of a country, other countries have to recognize you as sovereign in order for you to be a legitimate nation. So with Morocco being sovereign, recognizing the United States, that is a very important aspect to the foundation of America sovereignty. So it has to be remembered. So we're putting it in context that America is small and weak and needing assistance from a more powerful, uh, respected, and older nation. Uh, so we look at the importance that this treaty had. Now I remind you also that the treaty, this treaty of, of Morocco or the treaty of Marrakesh was the first African treaty with the United States or with America.
ever. Uh, it is noted that this is the first treaty with an Arab and or an African nation. So it's important that you understand that Morocco is an African nation, although it is um, dominated by the Islamic uh, pale Arab um, ideology, but it is nonetheless still part of Africa. Uh, when this treaty was ratified, it allowed a 50-year term. So every 50 years, the treaty has to be ratified. So when we look into the 1800s, the, after 50 years, uh, 18 March 1st, 1867 is important because it was the proclamation of the ratification of the treaty. Now what makes this important is that the other part of the treaty that helped America was not, it not also made it sovereign or recognized it sovereign, but because it recognized it as sovereign, it allowed other nations to recognize America as sovereign. And with Morocco, Morocco was coming as a big brother with to America's assistance to establish itself as a legitimate nation. So when you find it in, in, 18, in March, on March 12th, 1867, you'll find that this was the first time that the United States was introduced to the International Convention. Okay. Uh, and they were invited to the convention on behalf of Morocco to show the proclamation of the Treaty of Peace and Friendship to the world. So it's interesting that even in 1867, which, by mind, that in 1865, two years prior, there was a civil war ending in the United States, which um, black, negro, and colored people were now, had been freed from indentured uh, servitude or uh, involuntary servitude, slavery, that even in 1865, they still had no nationality or had any any nationality with their state. So they were not considered a citizen of the state or of the nation itself, even in 1865. At the same time, you know, two years later, Morocco is introducing America again on the world scale by allowing them to come to the international conference. Uh, so what is being looked at here is that what the treaty has provided was it provided American citizens or American the American government it allowed them the ability to set up business it allowed them to set up a commercial venture it allowed them to com continue to move commercially without the permission of Britain it allowed America to um, be introduced to the world as a legitimate nation. Uh, it allows America and, Mor and, 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 and Morocco to have a relationship that allows Moors to come to America and be equal to citizens of the state. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look at some of the articles that are, are present. When you look at what, how does the treaty relate to Moors or Moorish Americans? Well, like we said, the treaty was made for Moors. It, it discusses, in particular, Moors. Uh, but what has the treaty got to do with the the day-to-day -day running of a moor. When we look at a treaty, a treaty has its power through the Constitution. Uh, when we look at Article 6, Section 2 of the United States Constitution, 
we read that this Constitution and the laws of the United States which shall be made in pursuance thereof and all treaties made or which shall be made unto uh, under the authority of the United States it shall be supreme law of the land and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary notwithstanding. Well, what that means is that the treaty becomes supreme law, meaning that the treaty now has to be looked at as regards to whoever the treaty was made by. So if Morrison made a treaty, the United States has to look at the treaty and look at how the treaty, what was what is inside the treaty, and that will be law. Not necessarily just the Constitution, but what with the treaty and the provisions inside the treaty. So when we when we say that, look at that. Uh, if we look at the if we look at the actual. Um, articles and we're going to look at article 6 article 6 of the treaty it says that if any war shall bring citizens of the United States to their effects to his majesty the citizens shall immediately be set as at liberty and the effects restored. And in like manner, if any more, not a subject of these dominions, shall make a prize of any of the citizens of America or their effects, and bring them into any of the ports of His Majesty, they shall be immediately released, and they will then be considered as under his majesty's protection. Now what is that saying? It's saying that Moors, if a Moor shall bring a citizen of the United States to a barbaric territory, that and if they had their property seized and, and things of that nature, that they would be set free. The treaty says they have to be set free. And vice versa. If a war is in America, he has the right to his land. He has the right to his property or his effects. So, vice versa. These both, both are protected under the laws of that nation. So, this is Article 6 protected a war and put him under the constitutional fold. It allowed him to have remedy under the Constitution. Now, what is what is the difference between a Moor and a black Negro colored? Well, colored Negroes or NBCs were not protected under the United States Constitution until 1868. So, in the 1700s, when this treaty was ratified, uh, so-called black people, Negroes, were subject to slavery, and free blacks were not protected under the Constitution. So, even if you were free, you were not protected under the Constitution. And you can look at that by looking at the Dred Scott case. But, nonetheless... That Article 6 is important to um, our ability to be free in the time of slavery. Now, I'm going to look at Article 16 as well. And when I look at Article 16, it says that in case of a war between parties, the prisoners are not to be made slaves, but to be exchanged one for another, captain for captain, officer for officer, and one private man for another. 
And if there shall prove a deficiency on either side, it shall be made up by the payment of 100 Mexican dollars for each person wanting. And it is agreed that all parties shall be exchanged in 12 months from the time of their being taken and that this exchange may be affected by a merchant or any other person authorized by either of the parties. Okay, so what is that saying? I mean, that in case of a war, prisoners are not to be made slaves. Even if their Tripoli e is fighting the United States of America, they can't take those prisoners and make them into slaves. Because you understand that in this time, that American or English European nations were going into West Africa, East Africa, and taking slaves. Um, whether they were at war or not, they were taking these people as slaves and enslaving them in the Americas. Um, it, it is plain to understand that this is saying that you can't make them slaves. You, they're prisoners, and if they're prisoners, they can only they have to be exchanged within 12 months. So you can't have him as a prisoner for longer than 12 months. And if there's not enough exchanging, meaning if there's not enough to exchange between one party and another, that they pay in compensation of uh, Mexican coin. So it was important that if you were a Moor, you couldn't be enslaved. You couldn't be a slave. That was the protection. Now, what was also important, and I want to go back, because I did, I missed this. I want to go back to Article 6, because what I meant to discuss was that uh, it says in Article 6, if any Moor, not subject, not a subject of these dominions, so it's saying if any Moor, that's not a subject of the Sultan or the Empire of Morocco. That means that there could be Moors that were not in the jurisdiction of Moor, Morocco. They were outside of the jurisdiction. That means that they could be anywhere. They could be anywhere. They could be in West Africa. They could be in uh, America. You see? Which you understand that many of Moors, because we were seafarers, had already been in America. So there were many dark-skinned, melanated people in America. The word America is meaning copper-colored people of the America. So these copper-colored, melanated people, Moors, even considered Moors people, were already here. So if you were able to tap into the treaty, then you could use the treaty as a, a definite remedy. Um, and so, it goes further when you, when you look at the fact that in South Carolina, the petition said that if any more commits a crime, uh, that it would, they would not be subject to the Negro Act. And that's important because they are making the distinction between a Moor and a Negro. And the word Negro is not mentioned anywhere in the Moors Treaty. Um, but we do know that Moor means dark skin. They were dark, swarthy individuals that were um, had a particular status. So we as Moors Americans, when we deal with being a Moor, it is not always necessarily from a spiritual or religious pretext. It is often the fact that we're looking at cultural identity and a political uh, status. And when we look at 
the title of Moore when it was used with an American government, it it fundamentally meant dark skinned people. There was no difference between a Moore and a black in physical appearance. It was only in status and paper. So that is very important for us to understand, overstand. And so next time we'll deal with the Treaty of Camp Homes with the indigenous Americans here in the United States. So until then, I would like to say tuta nana to all my brothers and sisters. Salama.